Hello, everyone, and welcome to Conference on Asian Pacific American Leadership, Washington Leadership Program. My name is Shama Ahmed, and I am the Managing Director at Kapal. We are a nonprofit that cultivates Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander public service leaders for, by providing formative professional experiences and growth opportunities through our annual public service scholarship and internship program, our roundtable series, our mentorship program, and of course, tonight's Washington Leadership Program. WLP is one of our signature free programs that introduces students to NHPI leaders in public service who can inform and inspire students' own civic engagement. And um, we're pleased to announce that for the first time in Kapal's history, this summer, WLP series planning was led by a group of our recent scholar and intern alumni. So as a reminder, all WLP sessions are recorded and live streamed to our Facebook page, and they will be available for later viewing, um, including all the materials. So we're gonna go ahead and proceed with today's session, Educational Equity, Where Do We Stand? This session will focus on educational disparities within the ANHPI community, as well as the experiences of ANHPIs within the education system. Topics will include the integration of AAPI history and school curriculum, affirmative action, and the model minority myth, as well as access to educational resources. Panelists will also respond to audience Q&A at the end. So please follow and join our conversation tonight on social media using the hashtag WeAreKapal. And thank you to our speakers and panelists this evening for spending their time with us and to all of you for joining us. And a very special thank you to our 2022 sponsors for making programs like tonight's possible at Kapal. So now I am honored to introduce uh, Sheetal C. Shah to kick off this week's WLP session. Sheetal serves as the Senior Advisor on Strategic Partnerships at the US Department of Education. Prior to joining the Office of the Secretary of the US Department of Education, Sheetal was the Director of Philanthropic Engagement at the American Federation of Teachers and also served on the 2020 Biden-Harris transition team for the US Department of Education. She has spent over a decade working in the field of community school policy and practice, providing strategic support and guidance to state and local affiliates related to policy, advocacy, and school and district implementation of approaches to the community school strategy and extended learning time. Shiva, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Shama, and thank you um, everyone for spending your evening um, with this, what's going to be an amazing session after I'm done sharing some remarks with you all. Again, my name is Sheetal Shah, and I'm here working um, on strategic partnerships at the U.S. Department of Education. Um, I know that you've already experienced many amazing sessions in the weeks leading up to this particular one focused on educational equity. Um, so I'm super excited to be here speaking with you about that. And Shama pretty much read my policy experience. And so what I'd like to do before I share with you um, the priorities for the US Department of Ed around um, equity and justice in education is I wanted to begin with some personal stories because I think all of us, um, especially those looking to get into public service, those of us who are in public service, there's a reason we're in it. Um, and so um, I wanna begin um, by sharing this quote from Margaret Cho, the power of visibility can never be underestimated. This to me is key to our efforts in education across races, ethnicities, and geographies. While we're here tonight um, focusing on our community, um, I do believe, and I know we all do believe, um, that everything that we do around equity and social justice is for everyone. And so a bit of my story. Um, I came up through public education system, a child of immigrants from India. I grew up in a very small rural town in southeastern Pennsylvania. And until high school, I was the only non-white student. In high school, I was one of three Asians. The only three of us, the three of us were the only people of color. Um, Stacy, my Vietnamese adopted friend, Jean, the daughter of Chinese immigrants who owned the one Chinese restaurant in our small town. All of us were accepted, but never really understood. Nor did we have the space to share about our culture 
or life experiences that made us unique. It was easier to be invisible. The history we learned, the literature we read, the educators and adults standing in front of us and guiding us never truly reflected us. So, and I wanna put a caveat in, I know that many of you, if not all of you probably share the same experience and maybe have had a completely different experience. But for me, this is what sort of grounded me in wanting to work in public service. And yes, um, going back to my story, um, Stacy, Jean, and I, we were assumed to be the smartest, expected to excel in math and science. Substitute teachers thought we were foreign exchange students. And I will say that only one of us excelled in both math and science. It was not me. My preferred courses were Spanish and literature classes. And then another component for me, which became very visible in my sort of career in public education as a student, is how places were adept or not adept at engaging with families. And fundamental and core to my belief is families and communities are the foundation of how we receive and engage in education. And yet not once um, do I remember an educator or a school administrator engaging with my parents any differently than they did with other parents of the, um, the of, the, of my Caucasian um, peers. And yes, as a young person um, who was already different enough, this was great because I was able to fly under the radar. No one knew what my family was eating at home. I never brought it into school. But yet now in hindsight, and several years ago, I realized this obviously, it was a disservice to my educational experience. And those who actually were my friends in school, it was a disservice to them for not being able to engage and learn about our history, the good, the bad, as well as our contributions to society. And so, like I said, I know none of that is new to you. And to me, just fundamental again to educational equity, just to underscore are a few things. Across the board, we must engage with students in ways that they can feel connected and relate to what they're learning in school. Next is engaging with families so that you better understand your students, right? All of the adults in the school building should know about where their students, what those students are bringing into their school buildings rather. And then lastly, feeling safe and a sense of belonging. And again, none of this, the three things I outlined are specific to our AA and HPI community. It is important for all students and families. The first two, engaging students and families, is pretty self-explanatory. I wanted to spend a minute on the last one, around feeling safe and a sense of belonging. We know that there has been an increase in anti-Asian hate and violence. It's not new. And it makes me think, you know, back to our parents and grandparents, those who came before us when they first came to this country. And it is now even more increasingly in our communities, whether you live in urban, suburban, or rural, it's impacting our students and those students are going into our schools. So how are we preparing our school systems to support these students and families? And while I just shared some personal perspective, I want to underscore that with some of the key priorities from the US Department of Education focused on equity and education for all students. A few top level um, items that we're focusing on, which are connected and relate back to what I shared, is supporting the mental health and well being of students, diversifying the educator workforce, supporting these educators to work with a diverse set of students. So, how are we preparing them in these teacher and educator prep programs? language access and support for students and families, youth voice and engagement, and equi equitable grant programs. The US Department of Education, our biggest and largest contribution to the public education system is our federal grant programs. And so how are we ensuring that those are equitable? And so I wanna dig in a little bit more to what I just shared. Um, in terms of supporting the mental health and well-being of all of our of our students, we know that especially in our community and communities of color in general, mental health carries a stigma. We all know that 
so how are we going to uh, support the young people who may be coming into our schools um, with these um, mental health and trauma needs, right? Are we bringing in providers that are culturally responsive and acknowledge the homes and communities these young people live in so they feel safe enough to share um, when they're at school with these mental health professionals? Um, and going back to my point on violence and hate, what do our schools, what can our schools and what do they have to do with supporting a solution to this violence? What you see across the country is many schools are beginning to integrate trauma-informed practices during their classroom time, which means they have social emotional learning. There's whole child supports within the school. So that goes back to having, for example, mental health professionals within their school and accessible to our young people and ensuring also that each student has a caring adult to connect with. Additionally, when you look at mental health and well-being, schools and districts can begin to address this by partnering with culturally relevant community-based organizations that are embedded within our communities, right? Including faith-based organizations as well. These are institutions that our families and students trust and rely upon in so many ways outside of the school building. So how can we bring them into our school buildings? Next, when I was speaking about diversifying the educator workforce, for the sake of today's conversation, how are we recruiting and retaining A and HPIs into the educator workforce and profession, right? I have never seen a targeted effort um, to bring more of our community into this profession and to see it as a possibility. Um, so while the Department of Education is not solely just focusing on bringing A and HPIs into the workforce, I think that those of us who are in the public service space and or are working with um, institutes of higher education um, and other um, teacher prep programs, how do we get more of us into that space? And then um, supporting teachers and school staff to work with a diverse set of students, for example, through culturally responsive pedagogy, so that curriculum, the history that our young people are learning, the books that we're reading are all reflective of their lives, their history, and their experiences. When, you, when we're looking at youth voice and engagement, how are we, the A and HPI community and the broader community, supporting and mentoring our A and HPI youth in working with their schools and communities, bringing their perspective and experiences to the table to shape local and state policy? How are we engaging them in this activism? What more can we do? And then lastly, as I mentioned, um, around the federal grant programs, you know, um, one of the things we're trying to do is really, how are we conducting outreach to the variety of communities so that they can have access to our grant programs, not only access and knowing about them, but then build, giving them capacity to apply for the grant programs that can support their communities. So again, everything that I've outlined before, and there is much more, I've just given you a high level overview, they are all paths towards equity and education. My question to all of you, and I hope you'll think about this because you have an amazing set of panelists coming after me, is how are you in your various public service posts or maybe what you want to enter after you graduate college in terms of the workforce, Hopefully it's in the policy field and hopefully it's in the education space. How are you going to help ensure that social policies, no matter education, health or otherwise, um, that we put forth are reflective and supportive of our own extremely diverse community, right? A and HPI, there's so, so many letters in that that represent so many of us in a variety of different ways. We must work to ensure visibility of our community in an effort so that in an effort to have better policies and educational equity and justice for those young people who have yet to even enter the public education system, as well as for those who are there now and are seeking and need support. So I will pause now, as you, like I said, have an amazing group of panelists who are going to do more than pontificate and 
share stories, but actually I think provide you with some real concrete examples of how we together can really strive towards educational equity. So thank you, Hannah, Kapal, um, and Shama for allowing me to um, share a few moments with you all and look forward to engaging with you all hopefully sometime in the future. Thank you. Thank you for the uplifting and um, impactful message, Sheetal. Um, now I am uh, pleased to introduce Dr. Victor C. Thompson to set the stage uh, for our panel with an audience activity. So I'll introduce Dr. Thompson, who is a retired uh, director of the Division of Student Support Services for the Los Angeles County Office of Education. Um, he has 36 years of experience in education. He is a former high school Spanish teacher and principal. He is the executive director of the National Pacific Islander Education Network. He enjoys running, surfing, and playing the ukulele. So Dr. Thompson, over to you. All right, thank you everyone. And it's good to see you. Aloha from the islands of Hawaii and Yakwe from the Marshall Islands, Bula from the islands of Fiji and Talofa from the island of Samoa, which is my island. But what you're gonna need for our activity today is you'll need a ukulele or you can play the air ukulele. Okay, <laughs> so everybody ready? Here we go. Um, and yes, the um, this document is um, downloaded in the chat for everybody, so you can take a look at it there. But um, I appreciate our speaker, and yes, music is something that's very important for mental health, so we're going to do this too. But um, we're going to learn this song from the islands of Samoa called the Coconut Song. And um, so on the ukulele, we have the following. We strum the ukulele with our right hand. So just like this, you can use your thumb or your fingers and just strum one, two, one and a two and a one and a two, just like that. And then with our left hand, this is what we put down here on, on, the, on the keyboard. So this is finger number one, finger number two, finger number three, and finger number four. And each of these sections are called a fret. So fret one, two, three, and a four. All right. So let me show you the two chords we're going to learn. Chord means where we put our fingers, okay? So this first one is called the F chord. So you'll notice that your first finger is on string number three, also known as the E string. And then your second finger is on string number one, also known as the G string. So this is string one G, string two C, string three E, and string four is A. Fret one, two, three, and a four, okay. So we are going to play this uh, chord together. So your first finger is on string three, right there. And your second finger is on string one, right there. So everybody get ready to play the F chord. Five, six, here we go. F. Hey, you're sounding good. <laughs> good. Good. Good job. All right. Well, that was the harder chord. This is the easier one. This is called the C7 chord. So your first finger is on string number four, okay? Fret number one. So, again, your first finger comes right here on string four. And let's play the C7 chord. Five, six, here we go. C7, two, three, good. Now get ready for the F. You're gonna Okay, here we go. Five, six, here's F. F. C7. Good work. All right. So notice here on our music, it says F, two, three, four. So the four there next to the F means you strum the ukulele four times. And then the next one says C7, you strum C7 four times. So it's just like this. F, two, three, four, C7, two, three, four, and an F, two, three, four, C7, two, three, four. 
the amazing thing friends you just played the ukulele okay <laughs> fantastic so at the end of the song let me see if you can bring that down to the end uh yeah that's it thank you it says ending f so we play it like this f it goes like this one 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 so you just go one 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 that's on our f one 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 and one 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 all right well let's get ready to play everybody everybody got your ukulele ready this is a song very traditional from samoa and it talks about the coconut there's quite a few coconuts over there also talks about the rice the people like to eat rice as well as the taro the taro root all right here we go everybody on the f five six here we go f two three four c seven two three four and an f two three four c seven get ready to sing coconut keep going Thank you so much, everybody. You have now played the ukulele. Good work. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that fun activity. Um, I think I'm going to have to find um, my ukulele. I think there's one stashed somewhere in my daughter's closet. So, um, so now the moment we're all been waiting for. Um, I'd like to give a warm welcome to Rebecca Lee who will be our moderator for this panel. Rebecca serves as the Deputy Director at the White House Initiative on Asian Pacific American Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders. She was previously the Communications Director for the initiative under the Obama administration. And she's also served as a small business owner consulting for AA and HPI organizations. She served as the Chair of Kapal in 2013 and is also the co-founder of an anti-bullying nonprofit Act to Change. Rebecca will be leading the discussion and the Q&A tonight. So Rebecca, I'm handing it off to you. Thank you so much, Shama. And what a pleasure it was to be part of the very fun musical learning activity led by Dr. Thompson, and also to hear from my federal colleague, Sheetal Shah from the US Department of Education a while ago. I am so delighted to moderate Kapal's educational equity panel tonight. And as she did say, our goal is essentially to create safe, productive school environments for our students, including AA and NHPI students. And there are many paths to achieving equity in education. So our goal today is to explore various topics that would fall under the educational equity realm, everything from disparities, access to data disaggregation, to affirmative action, to the inclusion of Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander history and experiences in school curriculum. So there's a whole ton, ton of topics under educational equity, but we hope that tonight we'll just only begin to scratch the surface of some of these themes and encourage you all to dive a little deeper and to learn more on these. So. I do wanna add that we will have the opportunity to take any questions from you all at the end of this panel. So feel, feel free to drop those in the Q&A function in this webinar. So without further ado, I wanted to introduce 
our very esteemed panelists um, tonight. First, you've already met Dr. Vic Victor Thompson, who serves as Executive Director of the National Pacific Islander Education Network. Welcome, Dr. Thompson. Next, we have Benedict Kabua Madison, who serves as Assist Assistant Director and Project Specialist for Youth, Climate, and Nuclear Issues. Um, welcome, Benedict. And um, next, we have Solomon Chen, who serves as a research associate at Cato Institute. And then we also have Dr. Kani Ilunkowan, who serves as a board member at Make Us Visible New Jersey. Last but not least, we have Robbie Chatterjee from the Center for, um, Center for American Progress, as serving as associate director for K through 12 education. Um, welcome to our panelists. I first wanted to start off with a question for each of you. Could you please share what drew you towards a career in the education sector and how that path was informed by your own educational background and experiences? So I'd love to start with Kani with that question. Sure, nice to meet you all. And um, my family immigrated from India in the 1970s and I was born in Chicago. And I, I totally identified with what Sheetal was describing of her experiences. I was one of the few brown kids in my school. And um, I'm actually a child, adolescent, and adult psychiatrist. I'm not in the education sector, but I'm a part of, I founded an educational advocacy group called Make Us Visible New Jersey. And we lobbied together to get AAPI curriculum mandated in grades K through 12 in New Jersey public schools. And now the bill has passed, and now we're working on implementation. And New Jersey is a home rule state. Uh, so there are 600 different school boards in New Jersey, and we have to advocate individually at each school board to get the curriculum implemented. So it's quite a job, and we're coordinating with teachers, school board members. I've learned a lot about the education system throughout this process. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Kenny. I'm looking forward to diving a little deeper on curriculum and hearing more about you know, the work that you've done with Make Us Visible. Next, I'd like to turn it over to Solomon Chen, if you could, if you could describe your experiences and, you know, how, how you got into the education sector. Uh, yeah, thanks, Rebecca. And also, it's great to be on a panel with all these wonderful, talented people. Um, I'm from the Bay Area originally, from Hayward, California. And um, I was actually homeschooled through K, K through 12. And I think that was it was a great experience for me and one that my parents chose um, because it was the best fit for, for my need and for my family as well. And I think that's ultimately what's pushed me um, the most in the education space is knowing that at the core, uh, what matters the most is uh, the families and the families who are wanting to set up their kids for the best future that they can. Um, and homeschooling was a great way for my family and myself to do that. And Hopefully throughout um, the policy world and, and as we've discussed throughout this panel, um, there'll be more opportunities for parents um, of all incomes and ethnicities to continue to have the best opportunities for their kids. Thank you, Solomon. i love to turn it over to Benedict next to describe your experiences getting into the education space. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, so I uh, was born in the Marshall Islands and moved here to Arkansas at the age of six. Uh, so pretty much uh, have grown grown up here in the U.S. Uh, for most of my life. Um, but I'm with the Marshallese Educational Initiative, a nonprofit that's based here in Springdale, Arkansas, where the largest concentration of Marshallese uh, reside outside of the Marshall Islands. And I've been interested in helping my peers succeed in education. Uh, and part of my role with MEI is to increase educational attainment for Marshallese and Pacific Island uh, residents here in Arkansas. Um, from experience, you know, I had no idea how to apply for FAFSA or for college after graduating high school. Um, and this is the case with so many Marshallese here in the States. Um, there are a few Marshallese in the community with higher educational degree. Um, and in the Marshall Islands, many in the outer atolls or islands only have access to education up to the eighth grade level. And so, and then there are urban centers like the capital, Major, where some have access to high school um, and some go on to college. Um, for those of us here in the States, we have greater access to higher education, but we're still seeing that Marshallese youth here are struggling to complete high school 
because of family obligations or families don't know how to support their child's Western education. Um, in, in the Springdale School District where almost 3,000 Marshallese students are enrolled, uh, we saw an increase in the Marshallese graduation rate from 50% to now um, almost 75%. Um, it's still much lower than any other ethnic group in the district, but um, uh, we're also seeing that the rates of college enrollment are even lower. And my goal or my role now is to you know, support you in pursuing higher ed um, and then helping you then enroll for college um, and apply for financial aid. Thank you, Benedict, for shedding light on some of the disparities um, and just ways that we can address some of those disparities and access issues for Marshall East students. I'd like to turn this question over to Dr. Thompson. Could you share a little bit about how you got into the education sector? Yes, um, thank you very much. Um, I think the main reason that I entered the field of education was um, I had tried to become a doctor like my parent, my parents uh, become a doctor or a nurse, but I was um, not very good at math and science. So um, I was not a very good reader. <laughs> so so um, I had the opportunity to spend a couple of years in South America and I learned the Spanish language and then actually learned three languages there and decided that maybe I should become a language teacher. So I did major in Spanish. I was a Spanish teacher. Um, but I found that with education, I think similar to medicine, it's an opportunity to be a servant leader, to help others. And that is why I entered uh, this field. And um, again, it's just an honor for me to work with students and with the um, school community and with the parents. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Um, thank you for your service as an educator uh, through your career. Um, last but not least, Ravi Chatterjee would love to hear about your path to, to um, getting into the education sector. Yeah, uh, thank you, Rebecca. And again, uh, like some others have said, it's, it's really an honor to be on this panel with so many um, great voices and, and uh, experts, but uh, I will say, yeah, so kind of like Shisla had mentioned and um, Dr. Connie had mentioned as well, like I, I grew up uh, as, you know, Indian male in North Carolina, there was definitely not a lot of students who looked like me, certainly not a lot of teachers that looked like me. So I think um, I remember a lot of my high school experience being one of kind of erasure slash assimilation to a certain extent. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad to see that there's a lot more pride and, and I think voice right now around lifting up the Asian American and Pacific Islander experiences. Um, but really what I think, uh, you know, catapulted me into working in education is after, while I was in college, I had the chance to teach a couple of times during uh, my summers uh, as part of a kind of service learning program. And I really loved it. And so I became a teacher after college. And I taught fifth grade for two years in Phoenix, Arizona. And then I taught English in South America as well. Um, and, and all those experiences really kind of lifted up this idea of, you know, it was popular then to say there was an achievement gap, but really what I saw is there's a opportunity gap, right? Like it's not so much that folks were not achieving at um, similar levels because of any kind of desire. It was truly like some, some communities were given way more opportunities than others. And a lot of that, you know, depended on the wealth of the community or, you know, some of the resources that they had. So I, that was kind of what really pushed me into pursuing then a, a career in, in policy. Um, and, you know, that was what I got to do when I worked on in the House of Education on the Education and Labor Workforce. And, and some of the issues I deal with now at the Center for American Progress, really looking at how do we address the opportunity gaps and make sure that resources are actually equitably distributed among um, the students in this country. So, yeah. 
Thank you, Robbie. And, you know, how how amazing that you took what you learned in the classroom and you brought it into policy and advocacy. So would love to um, dig a little, little deeper there, Robbie. You and your team at the Center for American Progress released a report earlier this year on educational disparities within AAPI communities. Could you share a little bit more on those major findings that emerged on access and attainment disparities that should be informing education policies for AA and NHPI communities? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and just to kind of like highlight a little bit of the why we released that report. And I think this isn't probably news for a lot of our panelists and then the participants here, but a lot of times when we do talk about educational inequities, we're not always talking about Asian American and Pacific Islander communities. I think they, um, you know, for a variety of reasons that I'm sure we'll, we'll discuss throughout, you know, the next uh, hours that they, they they are often overlooked despite the fact that you know they're like the largest growing group in the country um but one of the things that comes with that is there's also a huge wealth disparity within the asian american population um as and, and there's a huge amount of diversity within and between the asian american and pacific islander communities so i i think a part of the reason we wrote that report was to sort of start to lift up the fact that there are different and unique needs um, and they, the kinds of solutions that are offered sometimes be, could be better crafted and better tailored. You know, but what we really found in our report is that, again, you are talking about a huge amount of diversity within and between the Asian American and Pacific Islander communities. And when you are talking about a lot of these students, you're talking about students with multiple, what you could almost say are like marginalized identities. Many of these students are food insecure, they're housing insecure, they are students with disabilities, they're English learners, they're refugees, they're students experiencing mental health needs. But, uh, you know, what we found is that that sometimes gets uh, missed, it gets overlooked. I think a lot of times uh, we've seen that the referral rates for Asian American and Pacific Islander students for special education services are not um, comparable to their, you know, white, Latinx, and Black counterparts. Uh, we also, you know, know that there is a need for better translation services. Um, Asian Americans actually comprise the second largest group of English learners in the country. Um, and so that was something we found as well. The other things that kind of that leads to is just that there's sometimes um, missing of these students for services and supports. Uh, can lead to then differences in attainment. And one other thing I wanted to note from our report that we found is that in particular, Pacific Islander students and Pacific Islander boys, uh, they actually endure a lot of disproportionate amounts of discipline. So they're suspended and pushed out of the classroom at very high rates compared to their actual population within schools. And that leads to a lot of cascading and kind of domino effects. Um, you know, some of the differences we found in our reporting was just that if you look at the dropout rate for Asian Americans, it was around 2%, but for Pacific Islander communities, that was 8%, right? So that's four times the difference. And then if you look at, um, you know, the amount of 25 to 29 year olds who had a bachelor's degree among Asian American uh, communities, that was around 71%, which is quite high. But then when you look, when you disaggregate it a little further and you look at the same, the uh, rate of bachelor attainment for Pacific Islanders, it was 22%. So you really do start to see that these differences in how students are treated, kind of the resources that they're given and the, the counseling and opportunities that they get really then manifest themselves in uh, graduating and post-secondary attainment. And one other thing I would say is that it, it really is, um, it's very dependent, and I'll, I'll wrap it up because like, I know we want to get to the rest of our conversation, but uh, you know, it is really dependent in many cases on sometimes the amount of resources and the wealth of the community. One um, other stat I will just give is that you know, access to rigorous coursework is a uh, thing that we talk about a lot in, in our work. And what we found is actually um, about 6% of Asian American students nationally attend a high school that has zero AP courses which actually for, that's not a, a crazy stat, that makes sense given about the national rate. But when you look at a state like Minnesota, 
19% of Asian American students were attending high school without zero or with zero AP courses. So, and, and then when you look one layer further, Minnesota actually has a very huge population of Southeast Asian Americans. There are lots of Laotian, Hmong, Cambodian, and um, Vietnamese populations there who tend to also be resettled or refugees and are again, communities with um, limited resources. And that's, that was, you know, a signal to us that we really need to be thinking about Asian American and Pacific Islander communities when we're thinking about school programs and um, the kinds of supports and services that could be helpful, English language services, special education services. So those were some of the big things we found in our report. Thank you so much, Robbie, for that. Just very comprehensive overview. You know, as we know, our communities are overlooked and understudied, and it's so important that we are disaggregating, uh, studying and disaggregating that data. You know, there's incredible diversity, like you mentioned, over 50 ethnic groups represented in over 100 languages and dialects spoken. So, um, you know, we really need to find, do um, study our communities so that we're able to, you know, have targeted culturally competent approaches and resources. Um, and then, as you mentioned, one of those groups we heard about is Pacific Islander students. So the next question, I wanted to turn it over to you, Benedict. Um, to help students overcome some of the barriers to access to education, you've done a lot of work helping Marshallese students, as you mentioned, and PI groups on FAFSA and college applications. And in your work, what have you seen should be changed to help make education more accessible? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I often uh, will ask uh, Marshallese high school juniors or seniors, um, uh, you know, do you plan to further your education after high school? Um, some will say yes, and others will say no because of the cost. And so college uh, should be made more affordable. Um, Marshallese in the States, uh, we qualify for Pell Grants, um, but we don't qualify for federal student loans. Um, we also do not qualify for work study. Um, and those who do go on to graduate school uh, don't have access to Pell Grants. And so they're stuck having to um, figure out how to financially support uh, their education. Um, as Compact of Free Association migrants, the Marshallese and others are obviously falling through the cracks. Um, uh, the Compact is being rene renegotiated for 2023. Um, and I think this is a perfect opportunity to address some of these challenges or disparities. Um, for those who are not aware, the Compact of Free Association is a treaty between the United States and the Marshall Islands. Um, and it exists because the United States chose the Marshall Islands to test 67 large-scale nuclear weapons um, from the 40s up until 1958. Um, and so the Compact allows Marshallese to travel to the United States without a visa but not enough is done to help families succeed here in the States. Um, you have adults who are working unskilled factory jobs. Um, families live paycheck to paycheck. So families are depending on um, starvation wages. And so it's nearly impossible for Marshallese families to save enough money to send their children off to college. Um, Pell Grants help at, the, at, at a two-year community college uh, where tuition is low. Um, but not so much at the, you know, at a four-year university. And it does nothing for those who uh, make it to graduate school. Um, so I think to address some, uh, these disparities, you know, Marshallese students need access to uh, scholarships. Um, and I think the U.S. government should provide grants to Marshallese students uh, for college aside from Pell Grants. Uh, so this way families can afford to purchase laptops um, and internet, which is ne necessary for students to succeed. Um, and also professors and, and teachers need to be educated on the history, educated on the culture. Why are we here in the first place? Um, because when people do understand why we struggle, um, they are more likely to be uh, understanding. They're more likely to uh, help us succeed. Um, and so more needs to be done to educate non-Marshallese about the Marshallese experience. 
Um, you know, the legacy of the nuclear testing is still an ongoing issue. Um, we're still experiencing that today, even though uh, testing ended six decades ago. Thank you so much for sharing, Benedict. You know, and just shedding light on just issues of affordability um, and some policy solutions there, as well as the need for broader education of the history and culture of the Marshallese. Um, next, I will switch gears a bit. Um, Solomon, in your work, how have you seen uh, the issue of school choice impacting educational access and opportunities for A and NHPI students? Thanks, Rebecca. And yeah, I'm affiliated with the Cato Institute, although these opinions are my own and not official institutional positions. Um, I think our current public schooling system is built off of this noble idea of one size fitting all students. And I think all of our panelists would agree that unfortunately it's not quite fitting all of us. Um, we've talked about, I liked what Robbie said about opportunity gaps. And at its core, school choice is talking about restoring agency to families instead of sticking within our current structure, which is 44% of most public school revenue comes from local housing. Um, and we could have a whole separate panel about the history um, of racial segregation and the way that school attendance zones and housing regulations really prohibit, uh, particularly students of color and homeowners of color um, from accessing school districts. And really what school choice is saying is saying, we want to restore those agencies and give those funds directly to the families so that each student can pick the education that's best suited for them. Um, when we talk about broad systems, um, they are in theory should, be, should work for most people. Um, but unfortunately for those, particularly within a minority culture, there's less of a political voice, there's less of, an, of a representative voice, particularly within school boards and school districts. And school choice is one way that families can get direct access to allow for individual decisions, um, kind of building off of my own experience as a homeschooler. Um, it wasn't because necessarily that my parents didn't like public schools or because there's some sort of anim animosity against other families, but it's just the fact that each student is an individual and that goes beyond ethnic groupings as well. Um, we talk about kind of diversity and it goes all the way down to the individual. And so ultimately our current system doesn't have room for flexibility. And so what school choice is saying is that our government policy should reflect more emphasis on the student and the family, rather than still staying to the district structures and trying to work within a system that has a history of systemic racism and doesn't really enable students of color within that structure and really saying, let's break open that and open it up to direct, directly to families. Um, so school choice is not, it's not a panacea, it's not gonna solve every educational gap, um, but it's really the start and a tool that can be used. Um, and it's not quite widespread, but it's been increasing over the last couple of years, particularly as we've seen during COVID. Um, and study after study has shown that school choice benefits low income families and students with special needs, um, which makes sense because as we describe at Cato, wealthy families already practice school choice. You practice school choice when you decide to buy a home in a, a great school district, as opposed to buying a home in a different school district. Or if you buy a home, you, or you can send your kid to private school because you have the funds. And so what school choice is saying is that all families should have the opportunity, not just those with means. Thank you, Solomon, for sharing um, you know, why you think school choice is a potential policy solution to addressing educational inequities. And also wanted to open up to the whole panel if there are any responses to um, what Solomon did present around school choice. Hello. Um I just wanted to add that, um, again, Benetic uh, alluded to this, but too often parents aren't aware, aware of school of choice. Um, it's interesting, and I'll speak primarily for Samoans and Tongans, um, school of choice for them is due to athletics. And so I'm hoping, again, that we can focus more on academics and on academic programs because um, I did find with my people that yes, not everybody is an athlete. <laughs> we have many that are, are good academic, you know, outstanding academic students. So I think that's another thing we need to remember here. Thank you, Dr. Thompson, uh, for sharing that. I would next like to talk about 
um, in this conversation about educational access, this conversation would be incomplete without discussing affirmative action. As some of you know, a case has been brought to the Supreme Court after a group of students sued Harvard University of allegedly discriminating against Asian American applicants by using standards such as likability, courage, and kindness during the admissions process. A similar case was also brought up after a group of students accused the University of North Carolina of favoring Black, Hispanic, and Native American students over Asian American applicants. I'll open this question up to the whole panel. How do you view the role of affirmative action and admissions processes in general in ensuring equitable access to resources for A and NHPI students? I favor data disaggregation for admission processes um, because uh, you know students get a choice of choosing Asian American, but you know we see there is wide inequities in Asian American and NHPI populations. So I think it would be a great advocacy to um, try to advocate for data disaggregation for admission processes and what Benedict was sharing about his community. And you know I, there there is a lot of invisibilities in the AAPI community that we need to address. Thank you for sharing, Kani. And I think, you know, we, we, we can agree that, you know, there can be improvements made in the emissions process and data just aggregation can be part of that. Um, we'd love to see if anyone else has thoughts on this, um, including on the topic of affirmative action. Yeah, Oops, I sorry, just want ahead. to, oh, go ahead. Um, yeah, I, I know we kind of affirmative action is, is talked more about in the higher ed setting, but I there is also kind of a lot of similar um, debates around high schools, in particular within urban areas. Um, where, where, near where I'm located in Virginia, um, there's Thomas Jefferson High School, there's also Lowell High School in San Francisco, San Francisco. And I think ultimately a lot of it comes down to how do you increase diversity of a student body within with all families trying to get to one specific school and the family doesn't get to a certain school there's a feeling of oh my student won't get this education that they deserve or it won't be able to succeed and break through different cycles um, and unfortunately we've seen a lot through a lot of lawsuits and a lot of parent-led groups from asian american men and women who are saying these reforms may be well-intentioned to increase diversity but often tend to disproportionately affect asian american students and a lot of that comes from um, problems of data. When you talk about not every person who's labeled as an Asian American is comes from the same income or even the same country for, for that matter. And so I think they definitely agree on the part of data in terms of saying, yeah, we're not all students under the Asian American label and not monoliths. And just because a certain group of Asian Americans are seemingly succeeding in these urban environments and at these educational sec uh, sectors doesn't mean that, oh, that, that, that ethnic group is good so we can move on to different groups, which I think is unfortunately the heavy handed nature of some of these reforms. Um, but also coming down to the point that families shouldn't have to feel like only their one school is the only way that they're able to get education for their kids. Um, and that kind of going back to school choice, but hopefully if there's more options before high school, even before college, so these families can feel like, oh, just because my student is not Thomas Jefferson, doesn't mean that I'm a failure. doesn't mean that my kid is not able to succeed. And that requires a lot of, um, I think, diligent reform from the, from the ground up, as opposed to saying, let's just have a Band-Aid uh, with the student policies. So I think it's a combination of talking through data and also talking through how can we perform up until that process instead of just talking about the finish line. Thank you, Solomon. Did anyone want to respond to that or add to that? Robbie? Yeah. Or, yeah. Um, oh, wait, sorry. Yeah, Benedict, you're actually talking when you talk. You go. Benedict and then Robbie. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So, in my experience uh, in Northwest Arkansas, you know, the local colleges and, and universities are pursuing for more, more Marshallese to, uh, to enroll in their institutions. Um, and they're doing that by working closely with organizations like the Marshallese Educational Initiative. Um, but, you know, as someone who works at a nonprofit and who works directly with the community, you know, I know how important it is for a Marshallese uh, person to be in advocacy positions uh, to help other Marshallese. 
Um, take, for instance, uh, during the pandemic, uh, our community was disproportionately affected. Our families are also struggled due to um, uh, the economic impact of COVID. And you know, while several organizations offered housing or uh, utility assistance, for example, Marshallese had trouble accessing these things or these services due to uh, technology issues and also language. And so Marshley, the residents have always felt more comfortable working with our organization because you know, it is staffed by people who look like them, speak like them, and who understand them. And so, and plus, we, we understand the barriers that affect the community, which makes it easier for community members to seek assistance from Marshleys versus a non -Marshallese. Um, So, you know, it's necessary that Marshleys are given the opportunity in the educational system to, you know, earn higher educational degrees and fill in positions in the work workforce to offset these challenges or barriers. Thank you, Benetik. Uh, Robbie? Yeah, I mean, I would just echo kind of like what some of the other panelists have been saying. I think affirmative action is, is by its default a complex issue, but I think some of the ways that it is implemented and exercised now doesn't necessarily take into account the, the as people are saying, the different kinds of needs of, of certain communities. And, and I think like others have pointed out, maybe uh, they don't have as much of the data as, you know, they could to inform some of these admissions practices a little bit better. I also wanna kind of hop onto what Solomon was discussing and, and I would just point out, I think one of the problems that you see in some of these affirmative action cases is that, you know, they're, it's almost used as a wedge issue between, I think the Asian American, black and Latinx communities and indigenous communities, because I think they, they only categorize so many places as being elite. Right. So I think like that in and of itself is a problem in the community that, you know, I think could be addressed, as Solomon is saying, kind of in two ways. One from the, you know, the top down and industry kind of admissions practices, but also I think in the communities themselves, I think there can be a reevaluation of like it is a success to go to uh, a statewide college system and it is a success to get a good advanced CTE degree or some of these other kinds of options that are, you know, also pathways into post-secondary success. Um, I think the problem sometimes is without a lot of technical assistance or awareness campaigns or kind of like a, a good educational sort of informative uh, way of letting parents know, they assume that only certain schools are good and only certain places are worth going to. Um, and I think that that in and of itself creates some of the problems that you're seeing. So I would just note that. Thank you so much, Krishna and Robbie. Uh, Dr. Thompson, I saw your hand was up. Did you have anything else you wanted to add? Yes, um, I just wanted to focus on um, the words that were used in the Harvard University um, situation here, but it talked about likability, courage, and kindness. And um, I think this is caused by a lack of taking the time to truly, again, understanding each race and culture, yet also not relying on stereotypes across the board for everyone. So perhaps a race may take on these characteristics, but we again need to take time to understand about each race, each one is very different. And probably more important than that is to take time to understand each individual for who they are and what they are. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. And I think we could probably talk about this issue for another hour, but um, just wanted to move on. I just dovetails into the next question, uh, which is for you, Dr. Thompson, as you were um, an educator yourself, as well as an ethnic studies advocate, could you speak to how our communities are often failing to be reflected not only within staff and faculty, but also within curriculum? And with the integration of ethnic studies into more classrooms, how can we ensure more equitable representation? Yes, um, 
Thank you. I um, so I think I am probably older than most of you out there, but <laughs> but um, I mean, when I first started in education back in the '80s, I mean, I was the only Pacific Islander <laughs> around. I mean, there there just wasn't anyone. Um, and, you know, I mean, even growing up here in America, that was the situation. I never saw a teacher that looked like me. I never saw a principal that never saw anyone. <laughs> so, um, again, it was very interesting. Um, as uh, ethnic studies was reflected on in the state of California, for some reason, they forgot to include the Pacific Islanders. I'm not sure what happened. <laughs> So we did have the opportunity to go back and meet with the superintendent of public instruction. He did apologize profusely. And we are now in the curriculum along with Arab Americans because they were also left out of the curriculum. But I think it is very, very important to, again, include each of the individuals within our school community to get to know each of them. Um, I'm very grateful that um, my organization, the National Pacific Islander Education Network, uh, also known as NPINE, and also my county office of education in Los Angeles, we again strive very hard to get to know one another, to support one another, understand what we're thinking, what our backgrounds are. And um, one of the things our organizations did was we, um, participated in all of the um, heritage um, functions within the school district and the office. So this included African American, Hispanic, as well as Asian and Pacific Islander. Um, we formed a uh, ukulele group and we played music at all of them. <laughs> and so again, the reason I mentioned this is these were our efforts, again, to get to know one another and learn more about where we're from. But we just have tremendous histories within um, all of our countries, our island nations, and it's so important to get to know one another and learn about one another. It just creates a much richer curriculum. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Thompson. And, and I know there's been a huge movement to include ANHPI history in curriculum um, within certain states and even um, you know, on a more national level, we recently saw a few weeks ago, President Biden signed into legislation um, the, to study the creation of a National Museum of Asian Pacific American History and Culture. Um, so you know, more integration of our experiences into um, what we're seeing in education and in culture. I would like to turn it over to um, Connie, if there is anything you wanted to add, especially with your work with Make Us Visible um, in New Jersey. Yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, according to Stop AAPI Hate, one in three AAPI parents report their child experienced a hate incident in school. And our kids are kids only once. And, you know, we want to protect them as best we can. As a psychiatrist, I see that these acts of hatred take an enormous toll physically and mentally on our children and communities. And I hear from, you know, patients about the fear that overtakes them, the nightmares that rob them of their energy, the hypervigilance that saps their playfulness, and the emotional numbing that diminishes their experience of the world, robbing our children of their childhood. And um, we feel that it's very important um, to show how AAPI has contributed to the building of this country. We're invisible in curriculum, and we'd like it to be known the many ways we've contributed. For example, most people don't know that we have birthright citizenship due to Wong Kim Ark. Most people don't know that ESL was due to the fight of Asian Americans to be included in education, that Title VII and Title IX, the reasons why girls can play sports in school are from Patsy Mink, the first woman senator of color. They don't know the Same-Sex Marriage Act was the first case was from an Asian American and Pacific Islander couple. And, you know, I feel that if children knew this history, knew the ways that AAPI is have helped make this country better, uh, they wouldn't see us as forever foreigners. And children pay attention to whose stories are told in schools and whose stories aren't, and it shows how valued you are. And we want our kids to know they're valued, that they contributed and they belong. And not only that, we want their classmates to know that. Um, so th they see that, you know, it's beautiful that we all built this country together. 
So I, I just wanted to share that. And I'm grateful for the movement that's happening across the country. So far, four states have passed bills to mandate AEPI curriculum in their schools. Thank you, Connie, for that very thoughtful and poignant answer. Um, you know, I would like to dive a little deeper into some of what you said, including um, what you're seeing that students are facing, you know, within the school setting, you mentioned that um, A and HPI students, you know, are facing issues when it comes to mental health. So wanted to ask you a little bit more about that and bullying challenges and how schools can better support our students in creating safer and more inclusive environments. Yeah, I, I mean, bullying is definitely correlated with anxiety, depression, PTSD, uh, physical complaints, stress. And one thing schools can do, number one, is to make children feel visible in their school. Like, uh, you know, it was, I'm, I'm very grateful that this curriculum change has happened. I didn't learn a single thing about Asian Americans growing up except the internment camps, um, you know, and I never had an Asian American teacher in my schooling, you know, and I, I hope that we can address those things. And then also, there are a lot of AAPI school psychologists who are making themselves available to teach about how to address anti Asian bullying. And, um, you know, we're happy to connect you with people who do that. Um, because I think it, it should be part of school psychology to understand that particular type of bullying. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Kenny. Um, so as, it, as we close out, I wanted to go around the virtual room and hear any words of advice from our panelists on just how, how folks, especially the people in the audience, can get into the field of education if they're interested in any of the topics that we talked about today. Um, can we start with uh, Solomon? Yeah, um, I would say actually kind of going from a personal note, um, to think back on your own educational history and also talk to your parents or your grandparents about their dreams and aspirations for you um, and also why they chose to sacrifice and um, essentially set you on the path that you are today. Uh, I think that's the, those are the people who probably know and care for you the most. And um, education is a big part of how parents um, care and, and desire to love their kids. Um, so I think really getting understanding of that and that's what propels me in my space um, knowing that my parents um, did that for me and, and wanted to make sure that's easy for all parents. Great. I'm going to go to the next person on my screen, Dr. Thompson. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, when my parents came here from American Samoa in the 1950s, again, they had studied medicine back on the islands and um, in those days, their degrees were not recognized, so they had to start over again. And so this is what my children learned. Um, this is what we try to teach young people that, well, they had to do it twice. Um, we could at least make the effort to do it once. And I remember going to high school with mom at night. My father got his um, bachelor's degree the second time at age 40 in his master's degree at age 50. So again, we can do it at least once. Thank you. I'll go to Robbie next. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think if the advice is how do you get more involved in education, I, I there are so many ways, but I mean, one of the easiest ways is to have more interactions with schools and teachers and students. I think, uh, you know, as a former teacher myself, sometimes I'm like, you know, you kind of uh, forget that just because you're not in the classroom anymore doesn't mean you can't get back in there and uh, volunteer or just talk to people sometimes. I mean, I think like there's, it's not as uh, complicated as we make it sometimes. I think if you want to know how teachers are feeling and handling burnout, or if you want to know how students are dealing with, um, you know, the stress of multiple different things upon them, it, you know, one of the best ways to do that is to try to get involved with local schools that are around you or in your own home community and, and just try to get more interactions with teachers, students, families, and parents and, and hear what they need. Um, that's the best way to, I think, make sure you're doing actually community-informed policy making, so. Thank you, Robbie. Uh, Connie? 
Yeah, I mean, I think as a child psychiatrist, it was very frustrating for me because I would see problems downstream. You know, I, I would deal with the problems in the education system at, after the fact. And I feel like if you're working in education, you're working upstream, you can make a huge impact and you're shaping culture and society. So I, I agree with what Ravi was saying to get involved with your schools. And even if you made a choice not to go into education, it's not too late to get involved because really like our kids are our future. And you know, it, it's, I think the most vital and important field. Thank you. And last but not least, Benedict. Yes, you know, there are so few uh, Marshallese who are in education. Um, you know, we need Marshallese teachers, professors, and educational support staff like counselors. Um, so my advice um, to Marshallese as well as the Pacific Islanders is, you know, please enter the field of education because we need more of you. Thank you all. Um, I'm gonna transition over to our Q&A section. I think we have a few Q&As in the um, function. So if you have any questions, please feel free to drop those in um, on the Zoom screen. So I'll first go into, we have a question from Lashmi O'Brien. Uh, thank you so much for organizing this. I am a teacher in a public school system in Kentucky. My question is how leadership or um, are there, is there a leadership or organizations that support AAPI teachers in Kentucky, the site-based decision-making SBDM law from the state does not allow Asian American teachers to be on the site unless 8% of the students are of the teacher's ethnicity. Also, Asian American teachers are not considered minorities as I understand it, but I may be wrong. It is a very difficult position to be in when leadership positions are passed over. So how can minority teachers support minority students? when teachers themselves face discrimination and what can teachers do to support themselves against such discriminatory practices? Would anyone on the panel like to uh, answer Lashmi's question? Dr. Thompson. Yes, in this case, um, you know, I would approach the leadership of your school or school district and basically confront them on some of these uh, shocking uh, situations here. Um, but as a teacher, I'd also address this with your union as well. But um, yeah, I, I'm very surprised that, that this is occurring and as a former site administrator, I would definitely look into that. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. And very sorry, Lashmi, that you are going through this, but we hope that you'll be able to um, bring this up, as Dr. Thompson said, to, to your union and to, to other folks. The next question is from Yansu Kang. Uh, don't we have to consider whether or not our actions on affirmative action align with breaking existing institutions based on white supremacist structures? Or does going against affirmative action only benefit the wealthy, predominantly East Asian students um, at the expense of black and brown communities, as well as low income Asians and Pacific Islanders? Why not pressure Harvard and other uh, schools to get rid of legacy emissions if we are so focused on meritocracy? Would anyone like to take this one? I mean, I'll just uh, note that I think there's a lot of agreement about getting rid of things like legacy practices on um, institutions of higher education. They are very much uh, kind of a structure of white supremacy and land ownership and wealth that are, are concentrated wealth in this country. So um, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I to the first part of uh, Yancy's question, I agree. I think that's what makes it a very complicated issue is that, um, you know, there there's definitely some data and other things that point to affirmative action being, um, like I said, a wedge issue, and it's kind of being used by, I would say, uh, some of the wealthier kind of the East Asian and South Asian communities um, when it has been shown to actually really benefit some of these other communities that you mentioned in your question stem. So it, I'm not really sure on you know what is the right answer here. I think though for your other question, getting rid of, rid of legacy admissions is definitely a, a worthwhile practice. Thank you, Robbie. And thanks for the question, Yon Su. Um, Last question we have is from Danielle Mangabat. As a public high school student in New Jersey, the only time I learned about Filipino American or Filipino history was briefly about the war and how President Taft called us little brown brothers. The way that history was framed really depended on a Western colonizer mindset. For example, Filipinos who were defending their own land were labeled rebels in our textbooks. While we do not need the addition of a NHPI curriculum, while we do need the addition of a NHPI curriculum in our classrooms, how do we unlearn harmful narratives about our own communities in classes such as history, English, et cetera? Would anyone like to respond to Danielle's question? It's great to hear from you, Danielle, as a public high school student in New Jersey. And um, I totally agree that it has to be well done and sensitively done. And um, you know that uh, that's why we're advocating for AAPI curriculum professional development across um, New Jersey, and they're both free and virtual options. And yeah, teachers have to um, learn about this colonizer mindset, and they have to learn about model minority myth too. Um, you know, uh, one of my friends and fellow advocates, she's a fifth generation Chinese American, and. Um, her daughter had a learning disability and she wanted an IEP for her child. And they told her, your daughter doesn't have a learning disability. You're just a tiger mom, you know, and these kinds of stories are unacceptable. And, you know, so there is a lot of work to be done to teach teachers and administrators about colonization and model minority myth. And um, that's why we think professional development is very important. There are a lot of also curricula available, free curricula available, but we think that professional development is also very much necessary. And we're grateful that there are free um, virtual professional developments available as well as paid options that are in person. Thank you so much, Connie. And thank you for that question, Danielle. Um, we'd love to also just share some of those resources that we've mentioned throughout the panel, including what Kuni just mentioned on curriculum and resources, as well as the report that um, Robbie talked about earlier in the session. Um, I did just want to close out the panel. I know we are at time, but really just wanted to thank all our panelists here for spending their evenings with us um, for this very insightful, enlightening conversation um, that only, like I said, began to scratch the surface on the many, many topics and the complexities of achieving educational equity for our students, including A and NHPI students. Um, so really do encourage you all to just continue to learn more about how you can be involved and be part of you know, advancing equity for, for our communities. Um, I will turn it back over to um, Shama to close out our session. Thank you again. Thank you, thank you. That was a very enlightening. Um, learned a lot through the conversation. Um, so thank you, Dr. Thompson, um, Solomon, Robbie, Connie, uh, Benedict, um, and of course, Rebecca, our 2010 SNI alumni and 2013 Gopal Boyd Chair. Um, that was a very thoughtful conversation this evening and thank you for joining us tonight. So if you um, enjoyed our fifth WLP session of the summer, we've got one more session this summer you don't wanna miss. WLPs are every Wednesday from 6 to 7.30 p.m. Eastern via Zoom. Our final session next week is Grassroots Activism and NHPI Identity, where we will discuss local movements and initiatives from the NHPI community to create change and directly impact communities across the U.S. So you can register on our website at kapal.org and view all of our upcoming events. Follow us on social media to learn about our SNI programs at Kapal DC. Kapal is also 
looking for board members for the 2022 and 2025 terms. So please visit our website um, for the application and all the full details and spread the word. Uh, thank you to our 2022 sponsors for your continued support of our programs and continue to provide opportunities for ANHPI in public service. Thank you for attending our fifth WLP session of the summer. We'll see you next week and good night.